We're back. Another episode. And a special episode. We have... We're going to start it off with, I might say, um, a very special guest. An interview, I guess you would call it. Yeah. How would, I mean, how would you describe him? Actor, writer, podcast host, DJ, activist? Dude looking for attention? That's how I like to go. <laughs> all Person around... who is... Yeah. All like around you're life gonna be on this show. I mean, yeah, right? Just all around person. If you're like, look, if you're taking the interview uh, on this hot show, then you could be like, yeah, whatever it takes. <laughs> yeah, you're willing to do it. So, Ladies I'm and gentlemen, down. thank you. It's BC <laughs> Wayman in the house. Uh, thank you. Thank yes, you sir. both for having me on. Yes, I, feel so, I feel so special. <laughs> <laughs> you are. You are. Official friend of the show. When you come on, then you mm-hmm. get official friend of the show status. Uh, first I question. To, yes, go. Uh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off, man. Uh, first question we ask every guest, though. Danny DeVito, is he overrated, underrated, or properly rated? <sighs> That's a good question, right? So I would think... <laughs> He's a good benchmark. First benchman. off, how old, are, uh, how old are both of you, like, if I may ask? I'm 33 years age old. Rate? 27. Okay. All right, so if you are... And I would think most people today, and I don't want to date myself, but I feel like most people today, if I think Danny DeVito, I automatically go uh, sunny in Philadelphia. Oh yeah, like that's where it's at. Like that's where he's got this uh, renaissance and kind of mm-hmm. this raunchy show and FX is kind of irreverent, silly show. I grew up with well, you know, Danny DeVito. Whether it's twins, you know, the, mm-hmm. the ridiculously casted twins with Arnold Schwarzenegger, Danny DeVito's tremendously over the top but underappreciated performance uh, in Batman Returns. Yes. You know, the Tim Burton film. Yes. So, but at the same point. It feels like I don't like looking at him when he's on screen. <laughs> so it's a real toss-up. Like, do yeah. you respect someone's ability and say, "God damn it, that guy is good at what see, he does," but he kind of causes me to vomit in my mouth when I see him? <laughs> like, I, I think that's ahead. a testament to his acting, right? If he's that ugly, and they still continue to put him in films, but you could have uh, the train wreck factor too, where it's like it's so bad you don't want to look away. Yeah, yeah, but he's so good in what he does. He's so good. At, he brought a uh, a whole new kind of vibe to Sunny in Philadelphia. That, oh, yeah. uh, when the show begins to get stale, you have these four you know mm-hmm. terrible people and their mistakes, and the show's kind of built on their assholeness <laughs> of being per, you know their assholeness persona. And so that to reinvigorate it, uh, kind of like when you add a kid on to like a sitcom that's mm-hmm. been bailing for a while, they bring this child on, but usually it goes in the shitter, right? Usually it completely tanks. In here. It revitalized them seemingly. So all that being said, and I feel bad, by the way, because I feel not just because it's 2022 and you should probably be nicer to each other, but to <laughs> pick on someone for their physical appearance. I'm not exactly a, a dashing uh, gentleman. I'm a fancy gentleman, dashingly <laughs> handsome. No. So t- it feels rude. I apologize to Danny DeVito. Uh, I think Danny DeVito can handle it. Um, to this. <laughs> yeah, he, he doesn't give a fuck. So. fuck <laughs> He gives no shit what we think. He's not listening to the show. Don't take it personal. You ask about every show. He doesn't even know the two of you exist. He doesn't give exactly. a shit. Exactly. It's just yeah. It's just an properly ongoing. Properly rated. It's just an o- properly rated. All right. It's yeah. A, it's, it's a long. Every answer I give is long winded. So. No, no, that's fine. That's fine. That's just an ongoing uh, argument that we have with yeah. ourselves and another. What has on. been the consensus then so far? Where do I rank amongst the answers? How, if you had to statistically break this down where would you put uh his the votes of the guests on the show as far as he ranks i don't think anybody is overly negative. over the top negative uh, about yeah right. over the top negative about uh, other than one guy that there is one one, one yeah. listener oh. um there's a devito has, hater huh yeah he just hates him so much but for no for the reason. most part most people play it right down the middle and and don't teeter he's He's not the greatest actor. I so. think he's pretty. He, he does serious roles. He does li- comedic roles. I like him in uh, Renaissance Man. If you've ever seen that, mm-hmm. yeah, very That's underrated movie. Stacy Dash, cool. I believe. Yeah. See? But uh, I feel actually now that I think about this in more depth, I have a little more respect. I was going to make fun of the one gentleman who's a <laughs> hater is going to hate kind of person. I'm going to assume it's a guy. I don't think I thought it was Ladies it's, Love Danny DeVito. It's, it's LLDD, like Ladies Love Danny DeVito. Like LL, <laughs> day was taken, but LLDD all day long. Uh, so it's got to be a dude. He's hating, uh, so to speak. But 
I actually admire his hot takeness. Like the rest of us, now that I think about it, are all like, yeah, he's good. Yeah. Like, properly rated is such a benign, boring, <laughs> vanilla, yeah. milk toast answer. So props yeah. to you, dude, yeah. for Take hating a... on Danny DeVito. Good <laughs> Take for you. a stand. If you're listening, <laughs> good for you. What, uh, so, so we, we, we covered his acting prowess. Yes. <laughs> now you're an actor too. Try to, yes. It's tough gig being a, uh, uh, slightly overage, uh, white male <laughs> actor trying to live in Cleveland, Ohio. That's a yeah. tough gig right there, bro. Like that's a hard sell. So you got to take the roles where you can. You're not exactly mm-hmm. in high demand. Uh, there's a billion of us trying to chase fame and glory as our twilight years approach us. <laughs> hey. uh, so uh, it's not bad though. <laughs> so it's on my resume because I've been I've been done it. Obviously not a professional speaker because I've done it <laughs> and I've gotten paid for it. Ergo yeah. professional. Uh, but the heights of Dana DeVito, pun fully intended, I have not seen. <laughs> Shit. That's good. We, I, uh, we've seen, we looked up kind of your filmography. Yeah. You Ooh. know? We, we, well, I mean, I watched Hey Mr. Postman all the way through. Yeah. And oh, I, good for you. Oh, yeah. That's actually very small role. Did you happen to catch maybe a state of mind from the same people uh, that did uh, Hey Mr. Postman from Skip Thomas Productions? I did not. All right, when you get a chance, immediately, immediately, immediately. upon this interview ending, hit stop. Don't post process. <laughs> don't send this to whatever third rate software you're using to record this. Uh, just literally be like, stop show, go to Amazon Prime, hey, Mr. P- or sorry, uh, a state of mind, a state of mind. Okay. Uh, great film, dramatic film, right? I took my dramatic okay. role there. Uh, and I'm only in the beginning of Hey, Mr. Postman. I had my yeah. little moment. Uh, ironically firing someone for cannabis <laughs> though I do that's my job as well on top of acting so ironically doing that which I always thought was funny um, but then uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, work with the production again Tina Hobbs style casting uh, Mike Berry directing the film both those films mm-hmm. um, being able to be a more dramatic role uh, with a state of mind about a young gentleman you know talking about mental health talking about suicide awareness especially in the African-American community. So it's a really good film. And I get the kind of comedic role in it, though fittingly enough. Um, but that also is a good film to check it out. But I must hear, because uh, I've seen the first five minutes of Hey, Mr. Postman. I'll be honest, I haven't seen the other 90. Uh, <laughs> oh, I don't really know what happens. Yeah, no, I didn't see it. I'm not a, I'm not a watcher of my own stuff. Yeah. I don't like that. It makes me it. very uncomfortable. I definitely yeah, do. Yeah, very uncomfortable. Yeah. It's... He, he yeah he tra- he fun. gets fired by you yeah. obviously um, yes and then he I set him on his path he started yeah. his journey I'm without like without uh, you I'm like Gandalf in yeah, the exactly. yeah without, I'm like the ring bro without me there's no quest there's no fellowship unless you got a piece of jewelry yes sir I am the ring that's how I'm going yeah for sure I appreciate that no but I mean as soon as I turned it on I was like whoa there's our guy right there first five minutes there I am awesome. there you right are right there in the beginning <laughs> ta-da well, he, yeah no ah. he takes a, a job at the post office and it's it's basically a joke of a job and they half of them take it too serious half of it half of them don't take it enough it's kind of a, a kind of have a Friday feel like a, a stoner film vibe to it yes um, yeah and then at some point um, Omar Gooding shows up and um well that, that he, just shit happens to you he's, it just happens he, he, he's the he's the he's um involved in a kidnapping and the postman ends up solving yeah. the kidnapping basically well you know that happens that's like you know that took a dark turn there right i actually read the script uh so i kind of remember it yeah um so it does take a dark turn there's a kidnapping but then there's more dick jokes so it's really <laughs> yeah, yeah. what's happening there at the same time so you didn't watch the rest of, so do you didn't get to interact with like omar gooding or anybody no, I did not. I only met Walter Franks uh, that day. That's a one-day thing. When yeah. you do those things, um, and I'll tell you, so there is a uh, – this is filmed in Cleveland, Ohio, and Mike mm-hmm. Berry's from Cleveland, and he's been putting out some films, bangers, like I said, A State of Mind. He's got another one that he's filming right now. Uh, but he's one of the directors that's able to get his work on outlets like Amazon Prime. Most of the things I do are hard to find. Here I can literally say, go to Amazon Prime. Films are there. You know, mm-hmm. You can watch them, which is pretty cool. Uh, so for this particular one, there is a, and it's in Euclid, Ohio, where the scene was filmed, a rundown, what used to be a medical clerical slash billing facility that is now an old empty office space. It's just a giant empty building full of old cubicles and old chairs and such. 
And so uh, I auditioned Sounds for the like role, it. which was in, you know, like an office. We went mm -hmm. to, they have an office, Hob Style Casting does over somewhere. And we auditioned for it, you did your thing. And when they sent me the address, I had just been at that office uh, two weeks earlier filming, um, I think it's called How to Be a Henchman from, okay. yeah. I'm going to remember the name of the company that made it. Uh, it's going to kill me. Dustin Lee. I can think of the uh, director right now, but I can't think of his production company. I'll think of it at some point. So I had just been there to film a different scene, and that happened to be the third time in the, a calendar year that I was in that building filming something. So basically this dude that owns this building just now rents it out to amateur filmmakers to Hell film yeah. their little office scene. So if there's an, an office-like scene in Cleveland, Ohio, it's probably been filmed in this rundown building. And so most of the scenes, a lot of them are filmed in there. They kind of just, uh, you know, change the backdrop. So that's a one-day thing. That morning, uh, I sat around for a long time, which you always do on these types of things, professional sets, mm -hmm. uh, which I've been on, or amateur independent sets. Just a lot of sitting. So I think call time's probably like 8 or 9, and uh, they filmed some of the other interview scenes that he did first. So you're sitting and sitting. And then we were getting ready to film the office scene, and I believe the bus showed up early. And so the opening scene with the bus was supposed to be filmed later, but we had to quickly adjust. We do the bus thing where uh, I think uh, Chris Harvey, the comedian, kind of the bigger guy in the back who's shirtless, yeah. got his little joke about the weed. So he's a, he's a stand-up comic out of Akron, Ohio, uh, Chris Harvey, funny guy. And so he's obviously willing to comfortable with his size. He's a, he's a girthy <laughs> gentleman who's good with taking a shirt. He was one of those guys. You always know him. You always got a he's, pal who's a – yeah, he, yeah, he does it well. Throughout the movie with his shirt off too, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. it's his. He's a guy who can do that, right? Yeah. Not everyone's comfortable. I don't like to take my shirt off in public. He is a – all the time. He's one of those people. <laughs> Respect. So, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, we do that thing. We film that. There's a lot of ad lib into there i think we had multiple takes where walter franks uh brian hey mr postman mm -hmm. is calling me a variety of different things like <laughs> uh eminem looking motherfucker Donald Trump looking. Just every <laughs> insulting kind of white thing was just coming at me it was funny though you did play, let me go back and say okay. you did play like the stereotypical white boss that fires the black thousand guy. percent i know my place <laughs> i know my place i do you know uh and so, yeah, that was my that was my job, right? That was kind of what I was supposed to do. Right. So, no, yeah. And then we filmed that scene uh, inside, which was a decent conversation. Some of it was ad lib, but most of it was the script that Mike Berry had written, um, along with his brother. And they both wrote the co wrote the script. Uh, so it was kind of that thing. But going back and forth and doing that, he had some improvised lines, and it was fun. So it's probably for that whopping two minutes maybe three minutes total right. that i'm on screen i mean that's probably four to five hours of filming wow. uh which seems weird but then wow. it pales into pales in comparison gentlemen when you think about some of these large scenes that take place uh in large movies where they'll spend an entire day for yeah. 10 seconds <laughs> 10 seconds it's crazy Man. so so in in all that I have a million questions just from your last answer. So yeah. working with him, you said there's some, some improv um, kind of in the dialogue. And I saw that you're a stand-up comedian. So do you like to maybe test the waters and see changing stuff around? Or is it like a, is it a line you don't cross with some writers? What have, what have you done with all that? Well, that'll actually, so in that film, that was one of the, earlier things i had done mm -hmm. one of the first times i really had gotten a chance to do a few lines in a film and i think i said verbatim what is in the script i was yeah. very uncomfortable yeah. with letting that i'm clearly i think if you've already listened to i have no clue how long we've been talking i'm clearly a verbose gentleman who has mm -hmm. total comfortability in my own skin and saying whatever the fuck i want so i'm cool with that mm -hmm. but in that moment i was panicky like, this guy is also, like, the star, and he's the hero, and I'm kind of, you know, the, the villain in that moment, so to speak. So mm -hmm. i got to play the, the fool, right? That's my job, is to be the foil and to take it from him. Like, I'm right. taking one, right? And so, and I'm very new to this point, and I was really nervous, so I said nothing. I said exactly what was said. But, fast forward uh, about three or four years, when we filmed A State of Mind, 
same people there was a different actor i was working with at the time mm-hmm. i had had way more opportunities to do things so we'll get into i'm sure at some point my backstory is what i've been doing this i but you know a midlife crisis essentially at 40 so i kind of reset like i literally like boop, hit the reset button on life and so uh five years later three or four years later we did a state of mind whole different person very much more comfortable embracing all of me and so while hey mr postman is verbatim what was on the script mm-hmm. i don't know if i even said an a or a the that was out of place <laughs> what takes place in a state of mind is 60 40. like i was able to i was very comfortable with saying whatever i wanted to mm-hmm. in the moment and a lot of it ended up making the film which i was shocked by i had this whole little funny bit about my wife and stuff in a state of mind that i never expected uh, and it made it and they liked it because yeah. i just got to be you get me. to turn the character into your you know it's it's like what you said you kind of mix it all together when you're just reading it off the script it's right you might you view know. the character a little differently yeah. than the, I than mean, the every writer person does. has a different personality so it's obvious every character should have a different personality you know sure yeah and i think you just gain like with anything right you just gain comfortability yeah. you always feel confident if you're willing and it's a weird experience to stand in a room and pretend right yeah. that's why you're pretending <laughs> pretending is weird i can't imagine pretending for like six months uh that's real professional nice dog uh yeah. for like six eight months <laughs> 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 i can't sorry i had to call no, no you're remember. fine you're fine we've been oh, called out before it's, <laughs> it's okay oh, what are you well, gonna do at some point you should lock the damn dog Jeez, <laughs> well, the first one. if it's the first time it happened Corey and alex i'd be all right but now i feel a little i take full responsibility <laughs> for that. all right it happens um i don't know what i was saying what was i ranting about uh improving your role Oh, uh, it doesn't help. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Going back to the I think just like, yeah, I think anything, you just get more comfortable in what you're doing. You get more confident to bring what you want to the role, right? Mm-hmm. Like you get, like everyone, as you said, has their own character, but you're not always willing to let yourself in. Oh, I know what I was saying. Talking about how, like, that's just for a little bit. I couldn't imagine being someone who has to live in a character's head yeah. for months and months and months. You know what I think about all the time? Have you guys seen The Punisher on Netflix? Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, so John Berthanol, who looks like, I'm sure he's a sweet guy, but he looks like an angry man, right? He yeah. just looks like he would be angry. To live in the head of Frank Castle, or especially the way Berthanol plays him, like this really angry, guttural, barely mumbling kind of guy who just is fucking mad like all the time. To live like that, pretending... It's got to take its toll on you you see why i've never thought about some it people would go obsessed or have you ever seen a man on the moon the documentary about jim yeah. carrey filming um the andy kaufman story that he did yeah that is and everyone hated him like he's all super serious into it and he's you know totally being andy kaufman all the time off set but you know his co-stars are like dude quit being an asshole or like the <laughs> person who's just trying to make a burrito for him for lunch yeah. is like oh my god can you just take the burrito, Jim? Jim, eat your sausage, egg, and cheese breakfast burrito, and don't give me your Andy Kaufmanist lines. Like, there's a fine line there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but for it's gotta sure. be hard. It's gotta be hard to pretend all that time. You can lose yourself, honestly. <laughs> but for um, I can see that. I think in the case of the Punisher, though, like a role that aggressively, it might be like a good release. Like, maybe I don't know. So mm. something bad. Happens. I can see that. No, I could see that. Yeah, I could, you're right. There's a fine line, right? It is fun to uh, – I got to uh, – what movie was it? <sighs> Shit, I'm terrible with titles. I don't remember. I'm terrible at promoting and things like this. <laughs> um, uh, hold on. Call Me. There's a film called Call Me out there somewhere on the internet or something like that uh, from RNA Productions where we filmed. And we did this – I was a bad guy, right? I was a bad guy okay. in the film. I was a, 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 a brother – uh, we were racist kidnappers, typecast here, people. So we were racist <laughs> kidnappers and abductors uh, of this woman and her family, who happened to be African American. And so we got to torture her. It was my only torture scene I've ever filmed. Jeez. Right. So we got to torture her, and I worked with this other guy, and I just met him that day. And we knew that we'd be filming more scenes later on, but day one was the torture scene. Mm. And we had just met each other, and then I met this woman named Barbara. And I'm like, hey, how you doing? Nice to meet you on BC. And I'm awkward already in nature. I'm like, I'm, I'm here to torture, to torture you. Later. <laughs> yeah. And so 
I was really silly all day, as I normally am. I'm silly, and I'm talking to them, and I'm making jokes, and I'm kind of, you know, we had to, once again, wait, a lot of waiting all the yeah. time, even. Um, and then the scene came. Gosh darn it, man. I got I got really into it. I got really <laughs> into it. And I got really aggressive, and I started thinking about all the terrible things like I wanted to do to people, and it was cathartic yeah. to kind of do that. So I could see, I could see how... If you got bad shit in your life, like being able to pretend do that to people, it might help, right? It's just an aggressive, like mm. getting it out of you kind of thing. Yeah, I like that idea. <laughs> Going back to, hey, Mister Postman, real quick, you fired him for smoking weed. Was he really smoke? Was it real weed in the movie? No, that was a tobacco That's filled. So joint. disappointing. Uh, yeah, it was. Multiple so jokes were made about it. Um, I think there was probably, you know, I'm sure there was cannabis being consumed at some point in the area, but that particular on screen, uh, fake. That's so fake joint, movie magic. Mm. Movie magic, fellas. Man. Now that ties into, that question ties into what, a, a, basically a big part of your life with your career, correct? Is that, is that accurate? Yeah. So once again, over the last, like, I spent. You know, I mean, I'm just a guy living here, like, in Northeast Ohio. Mm -hmm. I got a few kids, you know, married, do that thing. Uh, and I have spent most of my life, you know, from early 20s up until around 40 years old, so 15, 16 years, uh, doing normal businessy stuff, right? I was worked in marketing and sales. Yeah. I worked a little nonprofit. I was just a person who got to work, and I went 9 to 5, and I did my thing, mm -hmm. you know, and have life and have drama and have problems and just thing. Um, uh, I got laid off twice of so those two of those regular jobs. So you have the, um, kind of the 08 to 12, 13 time frame. Uh, mm. a lot of, you know, it was a lot a tough financial era. We had mass layoffs as a country in 08, 09. I fell victim to that. And then I eventually got another job in an office doing office -y marketing things like I do. Mm -hmm. And after about, I don't remember four or five years, that company sold. And so my job got eliminated again. So twice in about five years, my job was unceremoniously taken away from me. Right. And I was super unhappy. I got super unhappy with what I was, not in life in general, I love my wife and my kids and such, mm -hmm. but like in my place in life, you yeah. know, and also I you're approaching you. 40. Yeah. You're at a, you're supposed you're to do a more. Point. Yeah. Yeah. Like I was destined for greatness. <laughs> like that kind of shit, right? Yeah. What and happened? Yeah, what happened to me? You're looking, and that's true. I will tell you exactly. I was looking in the mirror, and I was, I was heavy, and I was out of shape, and I was unhappy. And so uh, it was 2016. I remember very clearly because we're in that time of year, January. I made a resolution mm -hmm. in January of 2016 uh, to get healthier and to do something with my life. I don't know if I've actually got there yet, but to do combine profession and passion more, right? Okay. Combine things I like to do. Uh, and try to make a career, finances off of it. So it started two separate paths. First was a, a healthier lifestyle, and I lost about 70 pounds over the last, over that first year and a half. Just went from being an extremely sedentary individual to running and yoga and working out, um, doing those things. So that Hell was yeah. fun, and a, a life changing adventure for me. It really altered me, you know, not just who I am, but the clothes I wear and everything, right? It changed mm -hmm. me a bit. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, trying to find jobs that could take advantage of my skill set, right? And so my skill set is like professionally marketing, thinking about branding and logos and merchandising, thinking about employee management and mm -hmm. these types of things. Like, so that's my professional skill set. Okay. And then I felt very comfortable with what I would say is my personal skill sets. And so during that time, of working in these office jobs is when I kind of started exploring a bit. I started, went to an open mic uh, in Cleveland. This would have been like 2008 or nine. did a little stand-up comedy. I think I took a class. I got on stage and oh, I yeah. felt very comfortable, mm -hmm. just very comfortable. I, nervous. I get super nervous before I go on stage, but I also, and though I didn't exactly, you know, kill people over with my material, I just liked it. I liked the rush and i had always had and at any office job i was always 
I mean, I'm still part of who I am. I was silly. I was talking. If I make jokes, I would lead meetings. I mean, I'm an outspoken person, mm -hmm. but it was always in this professional setting. Right. And so my goal was to find different jobs that could take advantage of both. So then it began a weird journey of anything that allowed me to do something creative. I mean, I did some weird shit. <laughs> some of it I still <laughs> do, right? Like I pretend to be, uh, do you guys know what standardized patienting is? No. I don't know. All right, so I learned about this on set of an actor once. I worked background on the, one of the LeBron commercials that he did for uh, Intel back in the day when he was here <laughs> with the Cavs. Okay. Um, so we did this commercial. Uh, I met another actor. We're just doing background scenes, background gigs. We'll talk about that later. That's a good gig, right? Make a couple hundred bucks for standing around doing nothing. Can't beat if that. you're patient, if you're patient, you can do it, right? Yeah. So standardized patienting is one of these things, which is a thing, right? It's in, in every city. Uh, you basically pretend to be sick, for lack of a better term, for student doctors. So you have all these different <laughs> teaching hospitals, ah, and they give you they give you a like case. Like Kramer. Exactly. Like yeah. Kramer. Oh, my God. Now I know that you're old yeah. enough to recognize that. Most people wouldn't. <laughs> yeah. But it's exactly like Kramer. He's got the scene. He smokes a cigarette. Yeah, yeah. Less smoking, but <laughs> like that. So you, you get a case, and so I work for – they don't do it as much anymore, but for a while, I worked for every hospital in the area. Uh, some are that. Some are where you get, hey, my name's Bob, but they give you all these details about your life, and you sit in these rooms, and you interview student doctors, and so they can get their practice. They do physical examinations. I spent hours just having, like, my left shoulder observed and managed, ear, nose, and throat. They even go to, this is where you make the money, but let me ask you, gentlemen. So they go to, and they have... And you can do this because they need to practice before they do it for real gynecological and prostate exam SP. So uh, on average, <laughs> you get paid about, say, 18 to 24 an hour to SP. So it's not a bad gig, by the way. You just have to have random daytime availability because <laughs> it's only for two or three hours at a time. Okay. But the gynecol I don't know what the gynecological rate is. I'll tell you what the prostate rate is. So for the prostate exam rate, which means you have to go into a room. Yeah. And you have to let. I'm pretty sure I know him. Up to four people. <laughs> oh, four. Up, up to hold on, hold on. Up to four people in the course of three oh. hours because they don't do too many at a time. <laughs> up to four people put their finger up your backside, do a practice test, and mind you, these are practice tests. People who aren't <laughs> as good as putting finger up asses. It's a new thing for them, so we're, they're not we're, as comfortable. We're both like learning here. <laughs> yeah. Your doctor that's familiar. Yeah, exact, exactly. Like, we're looking at each other like, I'm learning, you're learning. Like, we're sharing a moment. I'm not used to this. You're not used to this. Should I, you know, those things. So, uh, it typically pays, let me ask you this, 75 a finger. So, on average, you could get about hmm. 300 bucks for three hours. What's your rate per finger? Well. If you had to, if you had to pick a rate, like, once again, it's a job. Like, you have to look it at it on a scientific level. Like, they're doing this because... At some point, you are going to get old enough, and it's going to have to be done to you, and you want to know that that dude or that lady has done it at least a few times before they do it to you. That's so true. what's your rate? What so, would you have to be have to be paid to have that happen? This counts as a prostate exam, though, right? So like you, when you go to get your prostate exam, like this would no. count as going – this wouldn't count? Well, they here's, know there's a very you. awkward conversation. Here's a very awkward conversation that happens when you first start doing this gig of SPN. So clearly – they're going to talk not so much the interview ones, but the physical exam, they could listen to your heart. I've done ultrasound where I just have been ultrasounded for hours. So they could find something wrong. Yeah. But yeah. what they tell you is if they find something wrong, one of the directors of the facility will say, you should go see a doctor. Oh, and that's yeah. the conversation you oh, never okay. want to hear. Yeah. You don't ever want the director, like your the person who works with you at the facility to come out and say, we don't know for sure because they're a student, Damn, but like that. you should go. So I've never had that. I know someone who did, and it freaked them the fuck out yeah, because I now hope, you're like, what? Uh, so I hope they catch a, it on the first finger. Right. <laughs> yes. So A, they're not going to – if they test something, they're not going to know what they're feeling for, right. right? So really it's not that. So you have to decide is the educational value to these students how much value financially <laughs> – are you willing to go for up to four fingers in three hours? Now, all right, this is this is my thinking on it. Eighty bucks a finger with a new port each. <laughs> okay. a new port. And then I can do group discounts. 
Okay, well, group two, well, hold on. I feel like you just sold, I feel like 80 bucks figure is not bad. You should yeah. be giving discounts here. Hey, you just go in. I think we're all learning something here. No, I... no, 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 no. Yeah. <laughs> so that's technically then, that's actually, that's an 80, that's 320. Because that's four fingers. Yeah. And I'll, three I'll knock it down so, to 300. <laughs> all right, so you're going to give the rate. You're going to say, look, you throw in, you throw in the four, and I'll show you what I'm So really, yeah. it feels like it's actually not practice for them. It feels like you want this. Like, I feel like you just <laughs> right. spun this the other hey, way. Hey, no money's one money. It's like he already thought about this. No, it's, I've been thinking yeah, hard about it since it was brought up. <laughs> they no. were going to give you the money anyway. You're actually yeah. giving them less. They were going to give you. Right. No, 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 oh, you're sir. Right. You're right. I can't, Take I the can't 20 backtrack back. now. I yeah. can't backtrack now. Yeah, you're let's, just, let's you're just into inflation. It. Let's count for inflation here. Um, the other <laughs> things where they check your heart and stuff won't do that because then I'll start convincing myself that I actually have that shit. So, I can't do that. So you don't go to the doctor? No, I mean, I do. <laughs> Sam no. is like, no. Yeah, I do. All right, well, that's a different uh, conversation for a different day. One of the weirder ones. Oh, I'll finish my SP thought here. One of the weirder ones is the ultrasound because it's very it's kind of dirty so imagine mm. being in a room right so you're in this room and there's a bunch of people and they're usually training sessions and you lay on a table and it's very dark yeah because right? they got it's just dark in there and so you're laying down and you're usually in gym shorts uh and they're pretty good about they're respectful they're covering you and stuff like that and if you're a female you're usually in like gym shorts and a sports bra uh thing and if it's in the morning you can't eat you gotta fast because they want to be able to do whatever ultrasound does mm -hmm. but here's what happens so you have all these student doctors and sometimes it's even continuing education sessions and so they sit there and for hours you lay in your back you got two rules you can't fall asleep and it's super easy because they make it nice and warm for you and you're and you're kind of under a blanket and half the time they're like being educated and the other half the time you're being examined mm -hmm. so for like an hour you're just kind of laying there you can't <laughs> fall asleep but it's super hard then they come and they keep squirting you over and over again with that warm uh, the, ultrasound the jelly goo, right the yeah. jelly right and so a some students are very good some students are <laughs> like a ketchup bottle that's on the end and just splattering <laughs> you uh some students pick the wrong one that's not in the warmer and it's cold but when it's done like so now you have about seven or eight goos all over your belly and stuff they mm, kind of just hand you a towel and they're like <laughs> all right thanks it feels very whorish. Like, they're like, here's your towel, and now I'm doing like a horn back to the side, like wiping off all this goo, and then I have to go to the locker room, and there's not like a shower, so I kind of put on these clothes, and I got all this goo uh, on my belly, and you're just feeling dirty. I feel kind of a drive home of shame. Oh, when you gotta I do. like, it's a, you gotta like bird yeah. bath it in the in the sink. That's, yeah, you do. You uh, have to absolutely, because otherwise. And then you get home and you got this little like goose spot on your shirt because you uh, missed it and you're like, uh Your wife's like, honey, what's that? Yeah, like, uh, yeah. I don't want to. Like talk my about it. whole stomach is covered with this goo, <laughs> and they give you this little towel, and they're like, thank you. And I'm like, oh, I feel so, so dirty. <laughs> At least so, hose you off. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so standardized patienting. That's a real thing, by the way. If you Damn. work a weird part-time freelance thing, it's a great easy gig that you can get paid well uh, you don't have to be like a great actor it's just a lot of actors a lot of people who work uh, i know a lot of people who work public um there are several of the playhouses in the area so they're like a lot of stage actors mm -hmm. who work at night it's a great gig for them to pick up 100 bucks on a tuesday oh, yeah. um so i did stuff like that uh, i spent a month Corey and alex i spent a month rewriting adult products so i said this company these weird random gigs you find when you're trying to do something what they wanted to do is they were basically stealing. So they had they gave me descriptions of adult products like dildos and anal beads and all these things and wanted the me to stuff. rewrite it in thirty yeah, the great stuff, in thirty <laughs> words or less, uh, differently. So they could sell it on their website. I'm assuming it was like mm. both Russian stuff, so no one I don't know, it was all email, uh, and you got paid fifteen cents a description. And it only took you a few seconds to do it after a while. So all day long for like four days, I just looked at porn things and rewrote <laughs> porn to make these these different sexual adult toys sound as inviting as possible without making it seem like the original text, right? So it was this weird thing. You'd have to hide your oh, monitor yeah. from the kids coming in. And you just got paid screens of device. I, mean, I didn't even know half this shit existed. And I consider rabbit. myself... Yeah, like, I don't know what that is. Uh, but I gotta sell it, right? So you find either. all these weird things. Uh, a lot of weird jobs. That's how acting came about. That's how background acting came about. Uh, storytelling. 
in one of those things, going all the way back to the question you asked about 28 minutes ago, <laughs> um, was I was comfortable, you know, at that time in my life with uh, cannabis usage. I'm, I'm okay with it. I'm a bit of an advocate, but I'm not exactly, you know, out there all the time, you know, smoking it up. But I just was something I was good with, and I, I saw the writing on the wall as far as a potential opportunity as mm -hmm. it becomes more and more legal across the country at that time 2016 you had about i don't know 15 16 medicinal states and probably two or three adult use states in 2016 mm -hmm. and so and i knew ohio was close and on the edge and then in september of 2016 they made it official that's when governor Kasich signed ohio's uh, medical marijuana control program into existence and so around august or july of 16 i am googling or indeed, you know, whatever you mm -hmm. go, you know, cannabis jobs, Cleveland, and it's blank, and it's blank, and it's blank, and it's blank. And then eventually one day, right, there's uh, these other, a lot of Michigan jobs, Michigan had their adult or their medicinal program at the time. And if it was a cannabis job, it was like a scam. It was just not real. Right. Eventually, one day, business instructor at the Cleveland School of Cannabis comes up on the search line, which I'm like, well, that's a fucking scam. Like that cannot be <laughs> But I'm like, I get, uh, I'm okay with the plants, and I'm comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm a pretty good talker, like conveyor of information, and I have a pretty solid business mind. Huh? Why not? Right? Why not? Send it out. Send an email. I get a phone call from some dude who's in California, and he's like talking to me, and I'm like, totally, still convinced it's a scam. Like I just don't really know what's happening yeah. two months later it goes months now by the way this conversation ends like i don't hear from them for like 60 days i assume whatever okay that's probably a, a thing i should yeah. have not ha not had happen uh, i get a phone call they're like hey we're finally good to go are you interested the money is decent and i'm like sure i guess like i don't have to pay you i'm making sure he does not charge me you know right, all these right, weird yeah. things that happen uh but it it was a thing right someone saw the foresight uh, Austin Briggs, who was the founder of the Cleveland School of Cannabis, uh, the foresight to kind of get this educational center put into here, maybe train workers, and opened it, and that's how it started. And the Cleveland School of Cannabis, which is still running today, uh, is a, you know, it's like a trade school, right? Like a barber mm -hmm. school or a, a, any vocational school where you go to learn about a specific thing. Uh, and so I've been doing that for five years now. I've been there since it opened. Uh, one of the few people there from the start. So I teach, you know, this introduction to business class. It's very entrepreneurial focused. Uh, I teach a cultivation class from the aspect of operational management, mm -hmm. thinking about lean principles. I actually just got done teaching a few minutes ago. Uh, for, so that's what I just got. I just finished uh, teaching uh, lean techniques uh, and Six Sigma and methodologies of efficiency. Uh, so I teach. I'm not a plant expert. There are people way smarter than me, most people, when it comes to the plant knowledge, though I'm pretty comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. But I I take this, bring this very businessy side. And so because of that, which is a great opportunity, I still love it. We do a lot more online now than we did back then. It was a lot in person then. Mm -hmm. Just the, the nature of Corona and Zoom has lended itself to online education. And you realize, hey, you can work, uh, get students from across the globe. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to have them yeah. here. Uh, and then the school so, eventually got accredited, which it's the only accredited, wow. two accredited cannabis schools in the whole United States along with Osterdam. So, uh, which then led me to consulting. So working as a marketing consultant for companies, uh, which then led me to kind of starting more content creation and interviewing people in the industry. So, uh, it's been a few things. I do a few things in the cannabis industry, uh, and still probably, I think, looking for opportunities in there to kind of combine that professional side of what I used to do. Would you, weirdly, would you say that coronavirus helped the school of cannabis for you? Like, or do you I have, don't know if it helped the school, but it helped cannabis as a whole. So take a look at this. Oh, so, yeah. uh, well, no, it, it, cannabis. So 2019, right? 2018, huge year in cannabis, huge year in the fall and winter of 18, you start to see trending sales numbers. And with the, passing of the 2018 farm bill which allowed for the processing of cbd and hemp which mm -hmm. in 2018 19 that's when you used to never see cbd and then it became everywhere every pet store every gas station mm -hmm. there were whole stores right? based around cbd yeah <clears throat> but there wasn't possible until the 2018 farm bill and because of that 
I think investors and such started pulling money back from THC or anything above 0.4 Delta 9 uh, THC and started really getting into the industrial hemp market. So the sales and stuff from cannabis in early uh, 19 and early or early 20, I should say, are pretty low. Mm -hmm. But when the coronavirus hit, most cannabis companies were thinking they were going to fold. It was going to go under being deemed an essential business in every state that it's legal in right now. You know, the 18, there's 18 adult use states and 36 medicinal states uh, being deemed along with District of Columbia, being deemed an essential business was a godsend to the cannabis industry. The sales numbers in fall of 2020 compared to fall of previous years are outstanding. And they have just continued to rise. So as a whole, uh, even though 2020 was a good year for potential cannabis legalization, but then you had the Trump presidency voting, you had, uh, you know, we had some turbulence, you know, racially in the country back then. Uh, you had other, and you had COVID, so you had bigger shit happening mm -hmm. in 2020. And so it really derailed legalization efforts because more bills than ever were introduced in 19 to legalize it. Mm -hmm. So it really put a backseat, but the business fucking exploded and so it's a good time to be in the industry more and more states going legal and doing that so how cool. how far out do you think ohio is uh, realistically from being fully legal i don't think this is a uh, hundred percent my opinion with no inside knowledge other than talking to a lot of people about it Absolutely. lawyers and such people smarter than me <laughs> i don't think ohio will ever have adult use until the country does I don't I think Ohio is in any rush to have adult use. The, yeah. Most states, like Michigan, was 11 years between medicinal and adult use. It wasn't like it was overnight. Right. Mm -hmm. But here, I'll give my hot take if we're talking cannabis legalization because I love the subject. I don't think cannabis will ever be fully federally legalized. What will happen, in my opinion, is that at some point, could be this year, but I don't think so. I think it'll probably be more 2024 election time. That'd be my guess, but... Once again, not an expert. Uh, I think they'll deschedule it from Schedule so 1 to 3. I'm and sorry. if they deschedule it from Schedule 1 to 3, if mm -hmm. they take it out of the Controlled Substance Act and put it a Schedule 3 drug, then the states can do whatever they want. Mm. And now, here's the deal. There is 18 states adult use, 36 states medicinally, including those 18, who have already written their policies. Now the government's going to come in and say, well, I know you got your state policy, but we're going to rewrite all the rules on a federally. That's confusing, and it's hard as shit, and that's a lot of paperwork. Yeah. So why not just deschedulize it and just let the states do whatever they want without the fear of federal illegality? Because that yeah, opens up state-to-state -state exploitation. It also opens up uh, banking and financing. That's the reason all these banks have issues, because they're all federally mm -hmm. insured, and so it makes it difficult. So if you can just make it a schedule three drug life will be way easier and then the states can go forward and then i think it'll happen that's my guess will that, we ever have total federal no but i think it'll deschedule soon ish well that makes more sense than anybody who's gave me any other any other <laughs> argument so uh, yeah that sounds very educated it just makes sense on a on a logistical level like yeah. why would you not do that like yeah. why do you would you want to if you're the federal government why would you want to write all those rules and policies and arguments? The states already got it. Yeah. Half the country yeah. already has Let it. Let someone else just do so that. much money. Just take it off schedule one. Yeah. Make it schedule three. And it changes it it changes the banking industry. It brings more people into it. It's gonna allow, excuse me, more social equity and stuff like that, and it really will change it. So you just gotta deschedule it. Mm -hmm. And it's easier. But like I said, I don't know. That's my guess. It just makes the most sense. Um, but I think and that tends to be what most of the current bills being proposed by the senate or the house of representatives mm -hmm. uh tend to focus on deschedulization now that's so i also well, feel at least like that's a so step many in, bills in that yeah. direction you know and then that's all you gotta do it's, once you deschedule it then you're done you know? you don't gotta worry about it so that's what i would do Interesting. now getting back to one of the uh one of the pastimes you mentioned there how often are you going and doing stand-up how often are you was it just like a little fling you had going on? Or are you still trying to get out there? Uh, well, COVID put a derailment yeah. on a lot of that. Yeah. So prior to that, uh, I spent some time doing stand-up comedy. It was a tough... When I first started doing it, I was working a full-time 9-to-5 mm -hmm. job. 
Mm-hmm. God, and that's so hard because to be good at it, you have to be on stage every night. Mm-hmm. You just have to. And there were so many people who were so good. Some people that are doing it now. I started with people like uh, Mike Polk Jr., who was just getting started, who's now a face of Cleveland. Yeah, and we see Bill Squire, who's on WMMS, was just he. I saw yeah. his first set ever. Uh, so people like that were just that was the time frame when I was I've starting. They were a much younger than me, uh, but they were there all the time. Yeah, every night. And Mike yeah. was already pretty good with an improv troupe, so he had already had a tremendous amount of skill, but he was just starting his comedy career. But a lot of them, they were doing it every night. Yeah. They just had that dedication. And I was living in Akron and driving to Cleveland, and that's like 30 minutes away. Mm-hmm. So I'd work till 5 or 6. I didn't have to go to Cleveland till 1 in the morning, go back home because the bars, the comedy's a late night bar right. gig, right? right? Come back home, get back up at 7 o'clock. And then rinse and repeat, and that yeah. shit is it takes it. And I have a wife and kid, right? Like that takes its right. toll. So I pulled away, and then when I restarted this journey that I'm on, uh, that was a natural progression. Like, okay, well, now I have more time, I would like to be on stage again because I love live crowds, I yeah. love being in front of it. Part of the reason I started being a wedding DJ, I started being a wedding DJ. We saw that in, <laughs> in our research, yeah. we're gonna bring that up as well. Yes, sir. Take that in a second. So uh, I transitioned, I guess, a bit because I love telling stories and being in front of people, mm-hmm. but I'm not great at writing jokes sometimes, and so it's just hard. Yeah. So I got into, because it was a burgeoning scene, which took a hit during COVID, uh, I just did one recently, it's funny you mentioned this, to storytelling. And it was kind of a buzzword. You had places like The Moth in New York and stuff. So my mm-hmm. I did for a while there from... Eight, like 19 and early 20, pretty much every month, two or three times a month, I'm at a venue in Northeast Ohio uh, telling stories, yeah. stories from my life with a comedic twinge to them. Mm-hmm. So it allowed me to get up on stage, do that, do a 10 minute set. And I would do, there's a great place uh, run by Matt Farkas. Uh, it used to be in Cheese and Chong's. It's now at Twisted Melts in Highland Square in Akron. Mm-hmm. Every Tuesday he runs an open mic, a little plug, go check them out every Tuesday at 10 p.m. So I started taking my material to there to just test it. And I wouldn't get laughs a minute, but it would give me the time to be on stage, hold a microphone, yeah. work out some punchlines. Uh, and I'll tell you, one of the biggest things I've missed is that, right? Just mm-hmm. I do a lot of stuff on Zoom now and those things, but it's not the same, yeah, man. You don't get that, like e- that standing, same energy. Can't yeah, feel it. Standing, holding the microphone, there's yeah. a tactile thing, you get to it, and then seeing people's eyes is i don't know it's yeah, both i need to get out there scary now let me ask you this awesome do you yes. prefer the uh performing live like you are when you're doing stand-up in front of an audience or do you prefer acting behind the camera because one you get that instant gratification you know yeah, but he doesn't even watch himself he says that's so. true that is true Um, Well, there's two things. It's two very, very different worlds, Mm -hmm. right? Like there is – like acting on camera. I've done a few stage acting, so I think it's more equatable acting on stage to uh, stand-up comedy because it's – when we talk about acting. So on stage stuff versus on stage comedy is similar. But the Mm -hmm. acting – and once again, I don't do a ton of big roles, but I do do a fair amount of what I'd say are corporate training. Like that's the market. Mm-hmm. If you want to work in a market like this, oh. you got to do office training videos for all these yeah. different clients. Uh, and so it's part of that. But it's just show up and you, you really can look at all your words right before you say them. Mm-hmm. And it's just the key to on-camera acting. Once again, obviously, I'm not a huge thespian here. Uh, is just be professional. Yeah. Show up on time. And when they say, hey, can you do it with a little more quirkiness? Or can you be a little sadder? Mm-hmm. You can't be like, oh, it's my best thing. Like, <laughs> just do it the best you can. Can yeah. you do it happier? Sure. Can you do it sadder? Yep. And you just keep saying it and saying it, and eventually they'll be like, that works, and you move on. Uh, so that's fun, but there is nothing better than not knowing what the fuck is going to happen next yeah. and just going with it. Because on stage, and it's on stage play acting similarly, but uh, on stage play acting, you have a lot of other people. You have sets and things, uh, storytelling or stand up comedy, where it's just you and a microphone and 10 or 100 people or a thousand people staring at you. Mm-hmm. That is like pressure, but it is 
adrenaline. Like it's a mm-hmm. it's a euphoric type feeling uh, that you get. It. I get so nervous before I go on stage. I'm the type who uh, I used to, I learned this trick from someone, like I write bullet points out and I kind of put it on a bev nap and put it under my beer or something when I go on stage. Mm-hmm. Or I really try to bullet point out my set. And right before I go on or I tell a story, I have all these beats that I have to hit. Uh, I just, I study it and I study it and I study it and my stomach starts to turn and turn. And I keep thinking, well, I'll just pull out these notes if I forget. And then I hit the stage, I grab the mic and I just go. And I don't remember what I say. It's like a blackout. It's literally yeah, like yeah. being blackout I drunk. I don't remember that. Yeah. anything that happens when it is. I've seen myself on stage. I've seen people record me doing stories or stand up and send mm-hmm. me like a video. And I was like, shit, I didn't know I said that. It helped me a little bit because I realized like I flail my arms sometimes. <laughs> but I black out. Yeah. I literally black out and I don't, I don't know what happens. I just go and then I finish and then I get off stage. So that shit is fun like that's yeah. that's more fun than anything i, I love kind of like this though right this is like a conversation and you just don't know what's going to happen and you're just out there and you mm-hmm. say it yeah it's we a little more scripted in that regard we always have like a game plan before an episode you know we we, we list out movies we want to talk about we we were like all right we're good to go and then as soon just- as we hit record this shit just flies out the <laughs> window and then after <laughs> after we hit stop we're like, did we mention whatever movie? And <laughs> no, it's like no. the best movie. It's we like, talked about cheeseburgers for 35 yeah. minutes. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I like it, you know? It just it, it feels natural. Yeah. You know, you don't want to sound like a robot when you get up there. No, not at all. That's the other part, have, too, right? Trying to make it. It's a good time, though. Have you done any weird uh, corporate training videos, like sexual harassment videos or anything? <laughs> no, I don't think I've done... We did some illegal accounting procedures once. <laughs> and once again, we're not shit. talking tantalizing, but I'll tell you that's what. That's where I know it from. <laughs> yeah, that's where you know. I use the guy. That, you want to talk about the opportunity, once again, for someone like myself who's not going to be cast in a major film anytime soon, but to have a lot of speaking lines and parts, mm-hmm. it's that, right? So I can be a shitty employee who gets lectured to by his <laughs> boss in an accounting video for some firm. That's awesome because I get to talk. I get to act. Uh, you know, I get to get paid for it, so I'll do that stuff all oh, day long. Yeah. All day long, that stuff is fun. I don't have any crazy, terrible odd ones though. Most are pretty, pretty normal, right? Those types of things they're run pretty professionally. They're usually done by local production companies, you know, video and marketing companies. So they're usually pretty, pretty basic, but they're pretty good time. They're pretty professional. Hey, checks all the boxes off. You know, sure does. Making money. Yeah. Speaking role. I like it. I like it. All right. Well, listen, we can ask you a million more questions. And I'd love, I think it's all agreed upon that we'd love to have you back. But yeah, we've absolutely. already held you here for an hour now. And, and Are you serious? It's coming up. It's, it's creeping up on an hour. Yeah. And I, you got stuff to do. And we don't want to hold you because the we, busiest man alive. But I, I want to. I want to make a soft verbal commitment that we'd love to have you back on the show. If, well, uh, that is absolutely you know. uh, on point. I'm totally down. I was just getting ready to tell my story. I was going to compare. Uh, well, shit. Like, we have one more time for another story. All right. So, uh, <laughs> let me, you know, if we're going to kind of wrap up the acting yeah. experience, um, and a lot of that is small, like potatoes. I will say I have not had a large on-camera speaking role in a large film, but I have spent 25 days on a major Hollywood, well, I guess HBO Max, Netflix picture, uh, oh. being filmed here. And it was a weird, surreal experience. So uh, there are, once again, lots of jobs, right? People know there's all these jobs that are behind the scenes in a movie theater or in a movie besides just the actor, right? Mm-hmm. All the grips and the crew and all those things. And one of the sweetest roles to get, because there's, if you're going to be in a city like Cleveland, or anywhere else, you have to be able to take, uh, if you want to get paid, uh, background acting jobs. All right. So if there is a film that has a major film that yeah. has been in Cleveland, Pittsburgh, Michigan, or Ohio, including Cincinnati and such, filmed in the last three or four years, uh, your boy on the phone here is a blurry spot in one part of those movies, right? I can tell you, right? Okay. Uh, White Boy Rick with Matthew McConaughey, yeah. opening scene. My butt's on scene for about six seconds as the girl walks through. Oh, Check, shit. got it there. Every LeBron commercial for Nike and Intel that filmed for like four years, all of them, me blurry in the background. Uh, lots of stuff from there. Check, right? So all these different things, all these – Pittsburgh's got a huge market behind the scenes, a lot in Pittsburgh. Just blurry stuff. You show up. 
you make about 150 bucks. Once again, show up, be quiet, know your role, make mm-hmm. a little buck. And you get to watch famous people, right? Like yeah. I once ate breakfast next to Walter Goggins and Jim Gaffigan Hell in yeah. the middle of an old abandoned church campground filming uh, Them That Follows because they were doing this like there he's like a bible cult leader with it's in the snakes or something yeah. but the set yeah. was at this old church campground and it was freezing and so they just had a fire and we just all ate together in, in this, like a big conference room of this old church thing so you have those cool moments like mm-hmm. i just ate breakfast next to jim gaffigan like how fucking cool is that it's gaffigan eat for right? breakfast uh, the same thing we all did: runny oh. eggs and sausage. Like, because oh. it's once again, it's okay. what you got. Well, that's a, Some th- days are better yeah, than I others. Respect it though. Uh, he eats with the people. Yeah. By yeah. the way, film set etiquette: you can get super fat on a film set, even as an extra. There is nothing but food available. <laughs> oh my god! Snacks, like coffee, craft services. Is that what they call it? <laughs> yeah, it's craft services, and they have craft services for the main cast, and they have craft services for the background. You get more crackers and prepackaged nuts <laughs> uh, <laughs> than you do like fresh food. So background acting is a thing. It's not fun. You are definitely lowest person on the totem pole. But the goal is to be like that kind of tenure but not get the shitty background is Mm -hmm. to be a stand-in. That's the gig, right? So stand-in, if you're not familiar, basically uh, your role is you've got to kind of look like Mm -hmm. one of the main actors, roughly be the same height, same hair, Mm -hmm. same skin complexion. Uh, and then they will – you don't have to dress up like them or that they're doing their part. You stand in place as the camera crew sets up the scene, which can be a long time. Right? You can be sitting in a chair. You stand up. You sit. You move back, and they're adjusting your hair, and they're mm-hmm. setting up the light. They're setting up the thing, and then boom, they pull you out of the way. Dude steps in, says his lines, and then boom, you go back in and set for the next shot. But you get to watch all of it happen. You mm-hmm. don't get shoved in a back room like the background. You get to eat with the crew which is way better than eating with the background so they were filming a movie in here in cleveland uh and i've seen stand-ins and i got to be one for a day which was kind of fun oh and it's double the pay typically usually pays a little more that's always better Uh, it is better uh but you don't get any camera time but Mm -hmm. the reality is you never get camera time as a background extra like that's people that dream of that don't you just show up do your job don't worry about camera time um so uh do you know who jesse plemons is jesse Clemens. He was in. Uh, he's Todd from Breaking Bad. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah all right, Fargo yeah. season two. He was also the star of uh, Judas and the Black Messiah, which okay. is just on HBO Max, uh, with uh, filmed here in Cleveland, Ohio. So he's like an FBI agent. It's about the uh, assassination of Fred Hampton, the leader of the Black Panthers. Mm-hmm. Um, it's on HBO Max right now. You can check it out. Him and Lakeith Garrett are the two main stars, uh, along with. Um, the guy who played for the Hampton, Daniel Okoye, uh, who plays Fred Hampton in it. And so apparently I look just enough like Jesse Blemons, uh, who was also <laughs> available for the 21 days that he was filming this movie um, around the holiday season of 2019, mm-hmm. uh, that I got to be his stand in. That's the gig, man. Yeah. Every day I'm at all these different shoots. I'm showing up at random houses and these other things. You get treated like the crew. It's a period piece. So it takes place in the 60s. And so for the extras and such, you have to show up very early. You got to get put in the 60s makeup. They have to put all the sideburns on you and give you fake it. glasses. I wear a hoodie and jeans every day. <laughs> I'm getting paid more than them. I get to hang out with the crew. I get to talk to the main cast. I got to sit in. So, uh, oh my God, I'm terrible at names right now. So bad right now. Um, oh my God, Martin Sheen. Okay. Martin Sheen. Uh, I, know, I can't believe I could not think of his right. name right there. It was just totally. Uh, Martin Sheen uh, played the head of the FBI, right? Who uh, had this moment, and he had to go for a little bit, mm-hmm. and so they just needed someone to sit in his chair so Jesse Plemons could have his eye line to look at Martin Sheen. So one of my highlights is watching that film is when Jesse is talking to Martin Sheen in the office. I'm like, he's talking to me. I'm not talking <laughs> yeah. to Martin Sheen. But Martin Sheen cuts back and forth because you see his lines because yeah. he did it. But he's Martin freaking Sheen, so he doesn't need to sit there all the time. And he's mm-hmm. like 90, so he doesn't need to do that. So they pull you out, and I'm like, I get to sit in that chair because he talks to him. All right? And that's when it gets weird. But to watch that whole movie and know that everywhere he was, I was right before him. I don't yeah. know. It's a weird vibe. Yeah. It was a very cool experience to spend that long 
on a Hollywood set to hang out with all the mm-hmm. main crew and the actors and to feel like you're part of it, right? They show sure. up every day to these things versus the random background thing. Yeah. So uh, if you happen to randomly be the same height and hair color or skin complexion as a famous person filming a movie uh, and you have weird unlimited daytime availability <laughs> – uh, or the ability to work there. I mean, we're talking long days, though. Like, you're showing yeah. up uh, Mondays. It always gets less and less. So Mondays usually start at about 5 or 6 and go till 8 or 9. Uh, and then by Friday, you're like 10-hour days. But the first Monday Damn. or Tuesdays are usually 15, 16-hour days. And by the way, almost all of that day is me waiting to be told what to do. I read four books through the film. Four <laughs> books. Because you can't even look at your phone that long. You can't right. look at your phone. You get bored. You can't listen to music. You're like, but you can't really get that deep into something because you're always at random moments could pop up. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you just read books. You read a shitload of books <laughs> as you're sitting there waiting. But that's the gig, man. But it's a lot of work. It's a lot of hours. Uh, but it's cool. I'd like and to think next cool... time, uh, next time Matthew McConaughey comes into <laughs> town, I might have a chance. You know. I don't know. I saw his stand-in filming White Boy Rick, and that dude looked a lot like Matthew McConaughey. <laughs> if he comes back to Cleveland, because uh, the day I worked, uh, that's the day I first learned that the stand-in was the gig. I was mm-hmm. like, who are those two dudes who are kind of dressed like the main characters that keep getting talked to and appreciated by the crew, and now Matthew McConaughey just gave him a fist What? Give him a fist bump? How's, <laughs> what's happening? Uh, Matthew McConaughey, by the way, cool as shit. Oh, yeah. He, he looks of like all a the actors, great guy. Of the major sets I've worked, like he was, he talked to the crew. He was making jokes. Yeah. He was working the room. Like he stopped and shook hands. You can't take pictures. No phones ever. You'll get kicked off set instantaneously if you break out a phone. Hmm. Um, so yeah, it's a big giant no no on sets. Asking an actor for an autograph, you know, you can make eye contact, but uh, doing those things like pictures, huge. You'll get kicked off yeah. immediately. I mean, they're at um, work. You don't want to, you know. Yes, yeah. but he was cool. Yeah, yeah. Some, you know, some people aren't. Some people run back to their things. You know, and they're concentrating. They have to work on lines or do yeah. emotional scenes. But he was working that room on that scene we filmed, which was the opening scene of Gun Boy, White Boy Rick, which was filmed all in Cleveland. But I was oh, in the yeah. opening scene as a background. He was awesome. Like, and then I, but I did see these two people who were loved by the crew and i'm like that dude looks like mcconaughey <laughs> and i realized that was the gig like he goes off he's talking to him you know mm-hmm. those things and it was cool because you have that same vibe you walk off you're talking to the main actor you're like hey what's up he gets to know your name you eat breakfast with him Damn. you feel a little cool that for a little pretty bit cool, so man. Point out that's a, the low-key gig that's another job that kramer had also that you've had so Are you point that out. you're following some some footsteps i don't know god if i have a racist meltdown I'm I'm <laughs> you're really, right there dude i'm right there i'm on the i, I feel like i'm on a, that's a good trajectory for me that'll give me some headlines it'll make some news thank you for instilling See? they say all press is good press but i'm exactly. not so sure uh, i don't think that's good press yeah, i'm not so sure back know. then imagine like even then like he's kind of survived that if you do that now yeah, not good. He's kind of survived it though, but like pulling a Kramer, everybody knows that you're That's talking about. That's a good about, point. So. When is the last time you saw Michael Richards do anything, right? Yeah. Yeah, that dude. Uh, but yeah, I really feel like not even Michael Richards though. I have the career path of a fictional weirdo. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not not Michael Richards. You're cra- yeah, following Kramer's footsteps. That's better. Uh, That's better though, I think. I'm kind of leaving as we're about to wrap up. Kind of sad and depressed about my <laughs> no, 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 no. It's something to reflect upon, and then. Uh, next interview, just, we'll see how things have changed, how the trajectory has self moved. <laughs> self moved. I don't, I don't know, know what the hell I was trying to say right there. I was trying to be it's inspirational. Beautiful. That's beautiful. I was trying. Yeah, I'm just weeping into my own. <laughs> see, I into my, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do that. I just thought that it needed <laughs> yeah. to point it out. And they brought me down. Yeah. Now see if we come back. <laughs> see if I have to come back and be insulted by you again. I feel like. On my best move. We, we got to leave on level playing fields. We can't. We can't have anyone on a pedestal. You know. Yeah. Of sure. Course. I appreciate. Bring them down. It's like hey. the military. Bring them down. Build <laughs> yeah, yeah. them back up. Gotta That's make it. sure your guests know their place. The extra medium show. Like represent. Check out our rating, bitch. Like. Saying, right? <laughs> Not at all. Well. Oh, I should give a plug before yeah, I get that, that, exactly. That's uh, where I was headed. All right. Yeah. Let me do some plugs. Do those things. Um. I don't really – none of the rest of the things I mentioned are really huge to me and don't make me a ton of money other than what they pay me. So if you want to go check out the Cleveland School Cannabis, you can, but it's not that important. <laughs> uh, so we have uh, 
my podcast mm-hmm. uh, and my media channel that we're kind of launching this year, uh, Wayward Media, wayward.media on the internet, clickety-clackety on the fingerboard, uh, wayward.media. Uh, we got a bunch of stuff we'll be taking off. I do have kind of a podcast I was running called Wayward Planet. Mm-hmm. kind of relaunching it this year in the next week or two which will be very exciting um got some older podcasts out there behind the dock from evergreen podcast you can check that out we've been waiting to get renewed for season two not enough viewership or listenership so behind the dock on evergreen podcast both these wayward planet and behind the dock available anywhere uh, you listen to your favorite podcast uh so definitely check those things out yes, wayward.media sir. uh meet wm at m-e-e-t-w-m socially check all those things out go follow me i don't post shit but we'll do it through meet <laughs> wm i'm not a big social media fan. we'll talk social media next time we're on yes, i sir. hate it but love it uh so meet wm socially follow those that's for wayward media we should have big things coming this year uh, and when we get it up and running obviously Corey and alex will have you two back on the show reciprocation very cool uh, very let's cool. say on we go on video though we go video we go live stream on every channel uh that's available uh and we just see what happens i right? like it obviously i obviously like i think it. we got the ability to converse uh for as long as possible so very i'm not terribly cool. worried about faces for radio but uh we'll, we'll make it work yeah, me too, though, but you just no, go just with kidding. it, right? You just make it happen, and then eventually you kind of forget about it. Right? Yeah. I do. I kind of forget the camera's there, uh, and I just kind of talk and sit back. It's not really great, uh, I guess, viewing sometimes. Maybe it's just audio, but I think it works. It helps get you some more hits maybe sometimes. Who knows? Hell yeah. Hell yeah. I, everything will be linked in the uh, podcast descriptions on whatever site our listeners are listening on. So yeah. hopefully... We'll send some traffic your way. Yeah. There you go. I'll oh, we'll give a shout out to our buddy Jay, real quick. Jay, yes, who introduced sir. us. Yeah, uh, met Jay yes, disc sir. golfing. I can't believe I didn't, I didn't go an hour I'm, and a half almost without talking about I disc know. golf. I was going to go there, uh, but I know. We'll have to definitely hit up we, disc golf. We have people. disc golf and social media for the next episode. Yeah, so disc far. golf, social media, which we'll probably never get to because <laughs> you just talk weird shit and I'm going to go down past. Hey, I don't know what's hey, going to happen. We talk. Uh, Danny but DeVito shout out to Jay and his photography. Check him yes, out. Sir. Pictures taken by Jay for your wedding yes, photography. Uh, a subpar disc golfer, if he's listening. We'll put him <laughs> a subpar disc golfer. Uh, I like it. Probably better than I like me, uh, but I feel like i got to talk a little trash to Jay you have to. Uh, in that regard. I talk mm-hmm. trash once, though, to be honest. I talk trash once to Jay. Mm-hmm. We have a putting league that we run, and it's just this weird setup where you go to a gymnasium, and there's these baskets, and you putt. Uh, I had a spectacular week. I jokingly was bragging about how well i did i was kind of tongue-in-cheek some people your boy jay may have got their panties on a little <laughs> no clutch, way, not jay. called me out uh but dude showed up kicked my ass and it was hey, quite the humbling experience you, the following week so a week of trash talk yeah i do like but you know what here's what uh jay if you're listening you kicked my ass that week and you haven't showed up since yep like what's that about you yep. came in Beat me down. I get it. Like it happened. Could have been you a have fluke. Yet to give me a chance. Exactly. Could have been a fluke. Right. You maybe know. you just got lucky, son. Yes, like sir. maybe you just got lucky. Yes, so, him out. Uh, bring your plastic, Jay. I'll see you on the disc golf course somewhere. <laughs> our listeners should know Jay. He was on for our Star Wars episode. Yes, so. Jedi oh, my God, Jedi I love Jay. Star Wars. Yeah. Jedi Jay. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, I, I feel <laughs> sorry for him. Now I feel bad. He's called Jedi Jay. <laughs> we call him now. He doesn't go. He I, don't, I don't know if he does anyone not, else in the world has ever called him that. He does I think not he endorse get a hat. that name. It's a Jedi Jay on him. We're going to make it for him now. <laughs> yeah. It's got to happen. He's, he's going to love it. Kids will oh, love yeah. it. It's a fun name. It's popular with the kids and the ladies alike. He can start going to birthday parties. Yeah, Jedi Jay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right, well, well, thanks for entertaining us yes, and uh, coming on, and uh, yes, it's been sir. great, everyone. BC Wayman, thanks, man. Thank, Thank you, folks. sir. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, you guys heard it, uh, BC Wayman interview. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, went a little longer than we planned. Uh, great guy, though. Jeez. Great guy. Friend of show, um, friend of a friend. Yeah. We found out. Jedi J. And uh, yeah. That's it. No movies this week. Yeah, we're, we're just sticking with the interview this week. Uh, Shaman is here. I don't know if anybody heard him talk. But, yeah, uh, he said one thing. He's a little, little mouse in the corner. <laughs> a little cutie pie. But yeah, that was that was a great interview. Had a lot of fun. 
learned a lot about a lot of different shit. I didn't think, of, you know. Oh, like, yeah, we hope shit. you guys enjoyed it. It was more informal. We kind of let him just roll and uh, yeah. tell his stories and whatnot. Yeah. At the point of having a guest, you guys hear us talk every week. so. And you heard it here first. Verbal commitment to part two, so look out for that. Okay? And, uh, yeah, catch us next week. We're going to be talking drug movies. And, to tie uh, in with this, you know, kind of a two-parter. Um, all right. So watch the countdowns. Hit us up. Let us know what you want to hear. And I uh, hope you liked it. Peace. Be safe.